So today we're going to be solving May June 2021 paper 42. Okay. Question number one says an aqueous solution of chromium three contains the green chromium three hexa aqua complex ion. Complete the electronic configuration of an isolated gaseous Cr three plus ion. Now we know that the chromium atom, okay, the chromium atom has an electronic configuration of, okay, it has an electronic configuration of argon, okay, and then it's 3D5, 4S1, right? It was the exception that we learned about, right? Because it has unpaired electrons in the d orbital, so it's not 3D4, 4S2, it's 3D5, 4S1. And then CR3 plus has lost three of its outer electrons, right? So it's going to lose the 4S electron first, and then two of the 3D electrons, leaving us with 3D3. So then the configuration here is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and then 3d3. Define the term complex ion. Complex ion, okay, is a, is a species or an ion, okay? It is a species or an ion, okay, that consists of, that consists of, a central metal ion, central metal ion, okay, bonded to, bonded to one or more ligands. Okay, these ligands obviously form dative bonds to the central metal ion. This complex, CrH2O6, 3 plus, Aqueous shows some similar chemical properties to the cobalt hexa aqua 2 complex, cobalt 2 hexa aqua complex. Samples of this are reacted separately with either NaOH aqueous, hydrogen peroxide, or excess ammonia. Use this information and the data booklet to suggest the formula of the chromium species formed. State the type of reaction taking place in each case. Now, with sodium hydroxide, Right, they're saying that we get a similar reaction with this complex, with this chromium complex, as we did with the cobalt complex. So with sodium hydroxide, what did we form with the cobalt complex? Does anyone remember? So with sodium hydroxide aqueous, this cobalt 2 over here formed cobalt 2 hydroxide. So here, because we have chromium 3, we're going to form chromium 3 hydroxide, which is CrOH thrice. Okay. You can also say over here that three of the water molecules will be replaced. You can also say over here that three of the water molecules will be replaced by hydroxide. Either of these species would be accepted over here. Okay, and this would be a precipitation reaction. We're going to see the precipitate of the hydroxide here. Okay. Now, before we talk about before we talk about hydrogen peroxide, let's think about ammonia. Right? What kind of a reaction did we have with ammonia when cobalt hexa aqua reacted with ammonia? Now, when this cobalt complex reacts with ammonia, right, all six of the water molecules were replaced by ammonia. So here for the chromium complex, again, all six water molecules will be replaced by ammonia. Okay. And obviously ammonia is a neutral ligand, so Cr will still have the three plus oxidation number. So this is the formula of the chromium species. Okay, and this is a ligand exchange reaction. With hydrogen peroxide, we look at the data booklet and we find these two half equations. Okay, we find these two half equations. Now, what's happening over here is what's happening over here is this, right? We know that hydrogen peroxide will be the oxidizing agent, right? It'll undergo reduction, it'll undergo reduction, whereas Cr3 plus will be the reducing agent, it'll undergo oxidation. So if Cr3 plus is undergoing oxidation, right? If Cr3 plus is undergoing oxidation, that would mean that we're looking at the backward reaction here. So this would become negative 1.33. Would this reaction be spontaneous? Hydrogen peroxide is the oxidizing agent. It's undergoing reduction. That's plus 1.77. Cr3 plus is undergoing oxidation. It's the reducing agent. That's negative 1.33. So what's the overall EMF for this cell? The overall EMF for the cell is going to be positive 0 0.44 volts. So this will be a spontaneous reaction. So then what will CR3 plus be oxidized to? CR3 plus will be oxidized to dichromate 6. Okay, so the formula of the species formed over here would be CR2O7 2 minus. Okay, and this type of a reaction would be a redox reaction. 
or specifically if we're talking about chromium, right? Chromium is being oxidized, whereas the hydrogen peroxide is being reduced. This chromium hexa aqua 2 plus complex and this other complex over here, they're both complexes of chromium 2 and have different colors. Explain why the colors of these complexes are different. Now we know that color, the color in complexes arises because we have a difference in energy between d orbitals, right? We have two different sets of d orbitals with different energies and that delta E corresponds to a certain color, right? That delta E corresponds to a certain color, right? A certain frequency of visible light is absorbed because of the difference in energy and an electron is promoted, right? And then the complementary color is observed. But for different complexes, that delta E can be different, okay? So here we're going to say the difference in energy between between the d orbitals can be different for different complexes. Okay, the difference in energy between the dif between the d orbitals is different. Okay, in different complexes, therefore, therefore we can say that different frequencies, right? Different frequencies of visible light will be absorbed. Different frequencies of visible light will be absorbed, and different colors will be different colors will be observed this obviously this is for excitation right so and therefore and different colors will be observed all right the structure of this complex is shown. Ethanoate ions act as ligands in this complex. The ethanoate ligand CH3CO2- is shown as this. Okay. Water and ethanoate ions behave as different types of ligands in this complex. Suggest an explanation for this statement. So over here we can see that each water molecule, right, the oxygen is donating one lone pair. Whereas when you look at the ethanoate over here, right, this OO over here, Right, each ethanoate ion is donating two lone pairs of electrons. So water is a monodentate ligand. Water is a monodentate ligand. Okay. Let's say monodentate ligand. Whereas, whereas ethanoate is a bidentate ligand. Okay. So water is a monodentate ligand. So it's donating, donates one lone pair. Okay. And ethanoate is a bidentate ligand. So it donates two lone pairs. Okay. It's donating two lone pairs of electrons. Deduce the coordination number of chromium and the geometry around each chromium atom in the structure. So what's the coordination number of this chromium over here, for example? Want it to one, two, three, four, five, six different atoms. And same with this chromium. It's making six bonds. So what's the coordination number of each chromium atom here? Right? The coordination number over here is 6. And when you have a coordination number of 6, what is the geometry around the chromium atom then, around each chromium atom? This is known as the octahedral geometry, right? When you have 6 coordinate bonds, or you only have a coordination number of 6, right? You have an octahedral geometry with respect to the central atom. So each of the chromium atoms here is octahedral. State the type of the bond between the two atoms in the CRCR bond. What's the type of bond over here? For any complex, the type of bonds would be co dative covalent bonds or you can say coordinate bonds, okay? So what you have over here is you can say you can say coordinate bonds, coordinate bonds, or you can say dative covalent bonds, okay? Either one is acceptable. The following complex reacts with aqueous acid to form Cr2 plus aqueous ions. Cr2 plus aqueous ions react with oxygen under acidic conditions. Cr3 plus aqueous ions are formed. Use the data booklet to answer the following questions. Construct an equation for the reaction of for the reaction of Cr2 plus aqueous Cr2 plus aqueous with oxygen under acidic conditions. So here from the data booklet, we have the two following half equations over here, right? 
and we know that oxygen is acting as the oxidizing agent right because Cr2 plus is being oxidized to Cr3 plus so we're going to reverse this Cr2 plus equation here so what we have is we have Cr2 plus undergoing oxidation to form Cr3 plus plus an electron okay and what we also have is since oxygen is the oxidizing agent it's undergoing reduction in acidic conditions right so we're going to take this half equation for oxygen and what we have is we have this half equation for oxygen we have 4h plus plus four electrons to form 2h2o right so this clearly shows that cr2 plus is being oxidized to cr3 plus and oxygen is being reduced right in acidic conditions to get the overall equation for this reaction we have to balance the number of electrons so we just multiply the equation on top by four right so now we have the electrons being balanced on for both the half equations here right and now if you look at the overall equation what do we have on the left hand side we have cr2 plus plus 4 cr2 plus plus 4 2 plus 4 h plus so we have 4 cr2 plus plus o2 plus 4 h plus okay and the products that we have over here are 4 cr3 plus plus 2 h2o Calculate the E naught for the cell or the standard EMF of the cell for the reaction in E part one. Now over here we reverse the chromium equation. We reverse the chromium equation, right? So what we had was for chromium we had 0.41 positive 0.41 volts, right? For this half cell, right? The forward reaction Cr3 plus to Cr2 plus was negative 0.41. So 2 plus to 3 plus would be positive 0.41. And then for the oxygen half equation for the reduction of oxygen we had positive 1.23 volts okay so then what's the overall emf of the cell i'm just going to add these two up and you're going to get positive 1.64 volts you guys should remember that if you multiply the stoichiometric coefficients it doesn't affect the standard electrode potentials at all so whether you have four moles here or one mole or two moles right it doesn't matter what the ratio what the coefficients are here right this value won't be affected So here we have question number two, which says state and explain the trend observed in the thermal stability of the group two nitrates. The thermal stability of the group two nitrates increases down the group, right? Same for carbonates. And the reason why, okay, of the group two nitrates increases down the group, okay? And the reason why is because right the size of the cation increases the size of the cations increases right therefore the charge density of the cations the charge density uh, and the polarizing power and the polarizing power the cations decreases Hence, right, we have lesser polarization on the anion. Therefore, therefore, the, the, there is lesser polarization on the anion. Polarization of the anion, right, making the nitrates more stable. In other words, more heat is required to decompose them down the group. Lead 2 nitrate decomposes on heating in a similar manner to the group 2 nitrates. Write an equation for the decomposition of lead 2 nitrate. So we have a similar decomposition reaction here as we do for the group 2 nitrate. So we have lead 2 nitrate over here. will decompose to form lead 2 oxide. Okay. And then you're going to have nitrogen dioxide and you're going to have half a mole of oxygen gas okay 2NO2 and half O2 suggest how the ease of decomposition of lead to nitrate would compare to that of barium nitrate explain your answer you may find it useful to refer to the data booklet now in the data booklet okay you will realize that if you look at the ionic radius if you look at the ionic radius okay the ionic radius of lead 2 plus the ionic radius of lead 2 plus is lesser than is lesser than the ionic radius of barium 2 plus 
So if we have a smaller cation here, right? If we have a smaller cation here, does that make it less stable or more stable? We know that for the group, for group two, right? As you go down the group, as you go down the group, larger cation means more thermally stable. If you have a smaller cation, right? That would mean that it's less thermally stable, right? It has greater polarizing power. So over here, we can say that because, because lead two plus has a smaller ionic radius, we can say that therefore, Pb2 plus has greater polarizing power, right? Has greater charge density and polarizing power, okay? Therefore, lead 2 nitrate is, is less thermally stable than, is less thermally stable than barium nitrate, okay? Is less thermally stable barium ethane dioate decomposes on heating to produce barium oxide and a mixture of two different gases construct an equation for the decomposition of barium ethane dioate right so barium ethane dioate looks like this we have BaC2O4 okay the ethane dioate ion is this guy over here right it's formed from ethane dioic acid right and when it decomposes we form barium oxide and a mixture of two gases. So what two gases do you think you're forming over here? Now you may say you can form carbon dioxide and oxygen. You can form carbon dioxide and oxygen. You may say that, right? But then over here, right, if I have two carbon atoms, if I have two carbon atoms, am I not exceeding the number of oxygens, right? Since I have four oxygens on the left and I already have five, so we can't really have oxygen over here with carbon dioxide. But on the other hand, what if I had carbon monoxide? Then are the number of oxygen atoms balanced over here or can they be balanced over here, right? Now they can easily be balanced since we now have one here, two here, so that's three and we need one more oxygen atoms, okay? So you can't have carbon dioxide and oxygen over here. You're gonna have carbon monoxide and oxygen because if you had carbon dioxide, then you'd have too much oxygen on the right-hand side. There would be no way to balance this equation here. An impure sample of barium ethane dioate of mass 0 0.5 grams is added to 50 cm cube of 0 0.02 mole per dm cube acidified MnO4 minus, which is an excess. A redox reaction takes place and all the barium ethane dioate reacts. The resulting solution containing unreacted acidified MnO4 minus is titrated with 0 0.05 mole per dm cube iron 2 aqueous. The end point is reached and 30.4 cm cube of 0 0.05 mole per dm cube Fe2 plus aqueous has been added. So what they're saying here is that initially, initially we add excess manganate. The excess manganate oxidizes, it oxidizes the ethane dioate to form carbon dioxide and the remaining manganate is reacted with iron 2. Calculate the percentage by mass of barium ethane dioate in the 0.5 gram impure sample. Show your working. All right, and they've given us the MR as 225.3 for barium ethane dioate. Now, the first thing to note over here is, let's look at how much excess manganate we had. Let's look at how much excess manganate we had because we can easily determine that by comparing these two equations. We can easily determine that by comparing these two equations, right? We know how much iron two was needed, so we can figure out how much excess manganate we had. Now. So the first thing we do over here is we find the number of moles of Fe2 plus that we needed for these two to react, right? And what's happening here is the number of moles of Fe2 plus is the concentration times the volume, right? The concentration given to us is 0 0.05 moles per dm cube and the volume is 30.4 cm cube, right? So we divide that by a thousand. So what is the number of moles of Fe2 plus that I needed to react with the MnO4 minus? So we have 1.52 times 10 to the power of negative three moles of Fe2 plus, okay? That is the number of moles of Fe2 plus that reacted with the excess manganate, okay? So we had 1.52 times 10 to the power of negative three moles of Fe2 plus. So now we need to find the, now we need to find how much MnO4 minus was left, how much MnO4 minus reacted with Fe2 plus. Now, if you compare these two half equations, if you compare these two half equations, how many moles of Fe2 plus would you need? For every one mole of manganate, how many moles of Fe, Fe2 plus would you need for every one mole of manganate? Balance the electrons here. Can I say that for every one mole of manganate, I would need five moles of iron two? 
So can I say over here that when we look at when we look at manganate over here, right? When we look at manganate, we look at manganate over here, right? Can I say that the excess the excess manganate that I had, the number of moles was simply 1.52 times 10 to the power of negative 3 divided by 5. Since for every 5 moles of Fe2+, plus, we're going to have 1 mole of manganate. Or if you have 1 mole of manganate, we're going to need 5 times as many moles of Fe2+. Plus. So we found the mole of Fe2+, plus, right? And we can figure out the excess moles of manganate. So what is the number of excess moles of manganate that we have here? I have 3.04 times 10 to the power of negative 4 moles of manganate that reacted with the iron 2. Okay, so that was the excess moles of manganate. And we need to figure out, we need to figure out how much manganate reacted initially with the ethane dioate, right? We know how much manganate we started with. We know that the initial number of moles of manganate right we had 50 cm cube of manganate with 0 0.02 moles per dm cube concentration right that was the excess ma that was the manganate we started with so i can say that for manganate my initial number of moles my initial number of moles was the concentration which was 0 0.02 0 0.02 right times the volume which is 50 cm cube so that's 50 divided by 1000 so that was 0 0.001 mole, right? So that was my initial amount of manganate. So then I can figure out, I can figure out how much manganate reacted in the first reaction. This is how much was left over for the second reaction. We started with this much. This is how much was left over for the second reaction with iron 2. So I can say that the, that the number of moles of manganate, right, that reacted with the, the, with the ethane dioate over here was simply the difference, right? We have 1 into 10 to the power of negative 3, that's 0 0.001, minus 3.04 times 10 to the power of negative 4. So then, how many moles reacted of manganate initially with the ethane dioate? This comes out to 6.96 times 10 to the power of negative 4 moles. Okay. So now we figured out that now we figured out that this is the amount of manganate that reacted initially with the with the ethane dioate, right? So we know that we know that for the first reaction between the ethane dioate and the manganate, right? We know that over here, if we look at the balanced equation, right? We know that if we multiply this equation by if we multiply this equation by five and we multiply the equation below by two, that's how we're gonna balance the number of electrons. Right? So for every five moles of ethane dioate, two moles of manganate will react. Right? If we're balancing the electrons for the equation on top and bottom, right? For every five moles of ethane dioate, we need two moles of manganate. Okay? So then we can say here that that when we look at the ratio between MnO4 minus and C2O4 2 minus, I can say that for every two moles of this, I'm going to need five moles of this. So if I have 6.96 into 10 to the power of negative 4 moles of this reacting with the ethane dioate, how many moles of ethane dioate did I have to begin with? And if you cross multiply here and you figure out the number of moles, okay, what you get is that the number of moles of ethane dioate is equal to 1.74 into 10 to the power of negative 3 moles, right? So this is the number of moles of this is the number of moles of barium ethane dioate. So then what's the mass over here? The mass, the mass of this compound then is the number of moles times the molar mass. The number of moles is 1.74 times 10 to the power of negative 3 times the molar mass, which is 225.3. That's given to us in the question. So what does the mass come out to for this? The mass over here comes out to 0 0.392 grams. Okay, so then in the initial in the initial 0 0.5 gram sample, we had 0 0.392 grams of barium ethane dioate. So the percentage purity or the percentage by mass was 0 0.392 divided by divided by 0 0.5. Okay, 0 0.392 divided by 0 0.5 times 100. And that comes out to 78.4%. Okay, so that is the percentage by mass of barium ethane dioate.
Okay. I'll explain what we did here again. Okay. What we had was initially we had ethane dioate. Okay. That reacted with manganate. That reacted with manganate to form carbon dioxide. Right. There was some manganate left over that was reacted with iron 2. And they had told us exactly how much iron 2 we needed. Okay. Using the amount of iron 2 that we needed, we could figure out exactly how much manganate was left over after the first reaction. This was the first reaction. This was the second reaction. We can figure out how much manganate was left over because we know how much iron 2 we needed, right? From this 1 is to 5 ratio over here. Once we figured that out, right, we figured out how much manganate was left over and we know how much manganate we started with, right? The total amount of manganate, the manganate reacted in two different reactions, this reaction and the first reaction. We don't know for the first reaction how much we had, but we know the total is 0 0.001. So for the first reaction, the remaining manganate must have reacted in the first reaction. That was 0 0.001 minus this. So we figured out, okay, this is how much reacted in the first reaction. Once we know how much manganate reacted in the first reaction with the ethane dioate, we can figure out how many moles of ethane dioate we had using this ratio over here, right? For every five moles of ethane dioate, we have two moles of manganate. And once we're able to figure out how many moles of ethane dioate we have, we know how many moles of barium ethane dioate we have, right? And from that, we can figure out the mass. And once we know the mass, we can figure out the percentage purity in the sample, okay? Barium hydroxide is completely dissociated in aqueous solution. Calculate the pH of 0 0.120 moles per dm cube barium hydroxide aqueous at 298 Kelvin. So what we have is we have barium hydroxide and it ionizes completely in solution to form Ba2 plus and 2OH minus. If we're starting with 0.12 mole per dm cube of this, we're starting with 0.12 mole per dm cube of this, right? What's the concentration of hydroxide that we have? Right, for every one mole of barium hydroxide, we form two moles of hydroxide. So can I say that the concentration of hydroxide is 0 0.240 moles per decimeter cube? Right, that's the concentration of hydroxide. And then I can say, we want to find the pH, right? What's the pOH over here? What is the pOH over here? That's the minus log of 0 0.240. So the pOH comes out to 0 0.62, okay? And we know that the pH plus the pOH is equal to 14, which implies that the pH is simply 14 minus 0 0.62. So the pH comes out to 13.38, okay? For the three significant figures, we can say 13.4, all right? Alternatively, you can also say, you can also say that the concentration of H plus times the concentration of OH minus is equal to one into 10 to the power of negative 14, okay? You can figure out the concentration of H plus since we know the concentration of hydroxide and then you can also find the pH, okay? Both of these approaches are acceptable. Here we have question number three which says define the term standard electrode potential. The standard electrode potential is the voltage, okay? It is the voltage of an electrode of or, or of a half cell, okay? The voltage of an electrode or you can say a half cell, okay, relative to, relative to the standard hydrogen electrode, relative to the standard hydrogen electrode, and you have to specify standard conditions over here, standard hydrogen electrode, okay, at 298 Kelvin, okay, at 298 Kelvin, one atmospheric pressure, okay? And we're using concentrations of, and concentrations of one mole per dm cube for the standard solutions, okay? Three redox systems, A, B, and C are shown. The ligand one, two diamino ethane, that's NH2, CH2, CH2, NH2, is represented by EN. Two electrochemical cells are set up to compare the standard electrode potentials of three half cells. The diagrams show the relative potential of each electrode. Use this information to complete the table by adding the labels A, B, and C to deduce the order of E naught for the three half cells. Now, if you look at the first, if you look at the first cell over here, right? 
you have this en ligand and you have this nh3 ligand you're comparing b and c over here you're comparing b and c right you have the nh3 and the en ligands over here now we have the negative electrode in the nh3 so the electrons are going from electrons are going from this electrode to the electrode on the left right so that means that this nh3 6 2 plus complex right that is losing electrons to form 3 plus right it's losing electrons more readily and the en complex the en3 plus complex is gaining electrons to form 2 plus so if you compare b and c right which of these is which of these is gaining electrons here which of these is gaining electrons here more readily is it the ethan diamine one or the ammonia one which is gaining electrons more readily the electrons are going from ammonia to the ethan diamine one so if you look at the standard electrode potentials where is the gain of electrons more favored can we say that can we say that c is greater than b because the ethane diamine complex favors gaining electrons more and the ammonia complex the two plus complex favors losing electrons more so the gain of electrons is more favored here so the cell potential the standard electrode potential right the e naught will be greater for this guy because the gain of electrons is more favored here now in the other one right in the other cell we're comparing the ethane diamine complex to the hexa aqua complex right that's the complex with the water molecules and we can see that the negative terminal is the one with the ethane diamine complex in other words the electrons are going from the right to the left again so what that means over here is that the 2 plus ethane diamine complex is losing electrons to form the 3 plus complex and over here the 3 plus complex is gaining electrons to form the 2 plus complex so now over here we're comparing systems a and c we're comparing systems a and c over here and right because a is the complex with the water molecules and c is the complex with the ethane diamine which of these is more likely to gain electrons based on this information which of these is more likely to gain electrons is it the ethane diamine or is it the water can we say over here that the water complex or the hexa aqua complex is more likely to gain electrons whereas the ethane diamine complex is more likely to lose electrons so here if we're comparing which three plus complex gains electrons more readily we know that the water complex the hexa aqua complex is gaining electrons more readily right since electrons are going to that three plus complex so we know that a is more positive than c a is more positive than c so then this is our order right the most positive is a and the most negative is b okay so we have to complete the table by adding the labels a b and c to deduce the order of e naught for the three half cells right the most negative would be b over here right the most negative is b and the most positive is a okay so we have the most negative is b and the least negative is a okay and c is in the middle all right the complex r u e n 3 3 plus shows stereoisomerism the ligand e n is bidentate draw three dimensional diagrams to show the two isomers of this complex represent the ligand e n by using this notation name the type of stereoisomerism so if we have three bidentate ligands right what type of stereoisomerism do we have we have optical isomerism right we have optical isomerism and since we have octahedral complexes right since we have three bidentate ligands so that means the coordination number is six over here right so we have to show the optical isomerism for these octahedral complexes okay so what we have here is let's say we have this guy okay then we have this guy over here and then we have this guy okay and then the mirror image of this the mirror image of this will look like this right we have this we have this and then we have this over here okay so these are these are non superimposable mirror images of each other okay they're enantiomers of each other we can say they're optical isomers of each other an electrochemical cell consists of a bromine bromide half cell and a silver plus silver metal half cell under standard conditions use the data booklet to calculate the emf of the cell deduce the direction of electron flow in the wire through the voltmeter between these two half cells so from the data booklet we have these two half equations we have these two half equations over here now my question is when you look at these two half equations 
which of which of these species silver plus or bromine is more likely to gain electrons can we say that bromine gains electrons more readily in other words it's a better oxidizing agent than silver plus right so if we're if we're compare if we're if we're if we're connecting bromine and silver if we're compare if we're connecting bromine and silver over here we know for a fact that the bromine will be the one gaining electrons the bromine will be the one gaining the electrons whereas the silver will be the one losing the electrons right so then we have to reverse we have to reverse the half equation for the silver right so for the silver we're going to have this half equation we're going to have ag losing electrons to form ag plus plus electrons right and instead of positive 0 0.80 now this has and E naught of negative 0 0.80. So then what's the overall EMF of the cell? We have 1.07 minus 0 0.80. So that would be positive 0 0.27 volts, right? And you know that the bromine is gaining electrons and the silver is losing electrons, right? So the electrons are going from silver. The electrons are going from the silver half cell. Okay, they're going from the silver half cell to the bromine half cell. Water is added, water is added to the silver half cell in B part 1. Suggest the effect of this addition on the overall EMF of the cell. Place a tick in the appropriate box. Now, if water is added to this, if water is added to this half cell, what's happening to the concentration of silver ions? If I'm adding water, what's happening to the concentration of silver ions? By adding water to this half cell, I'm decreasing the concentration of silver ions. I'm decreasing the concentration of silver ions over here, right? And if I decrease the concentration of silver ions, right, I'm making a more dilute solution of silver ions. What's happening to this equilibrium here? Is it going to shift to the right or the left? If I decrease silver plus, right, then the equilibrium will shift to the, the equilibrium will shift further to the right. It will shift further to the right. And then if the equilibrium is shifting further to the right here, is this value becoming less negative or more negative? this value if the equilibrium is shifting forward right the forward reaction is becoming more spontaneous this value is becoming less negative so if this value becomes less negative let's say for example instead of negative 0 0.8 we have negative 0 0.7 the overall emf of the cell becomes more positive right because you're doing 1.07 minus this value right if this becomes less negative then the overall emf becomes more positive okay and the reason why over here is, as we just mentioned, the concentration of Ag plus decreases, right? Because we're making a more dilute solution. And this means that because we're decreasing the silver plus concentration, right? This EMF is becoming less negative, okay? So we can say, therefore, therefore this equilibrium here, right? This equilibrium here, right? The M, the E naught for this equilibrium becomes less negative the e for the equilibrium shown the equilibrium shown becomes less negative and that obviously means that the overall emf of the cell becomes more positive silver bromide dissolves in an aqueous solution of s2o3 2 minus ions to form the complex ion shown here this, these ions act as monodentate ligands. Here they've shown the equilibrium for the reaction with silver bromide and these ions over here. Define the term ligand. So a ligand is a species, okay, that donates a lone pair of electrons or lone pairs of electrons, okay, lone pair of electrons to form to form a dative bond to a central metal atom or ion, to a central metal atom or ion. Write an expression for the equilibrium constant Kc for the equilibrium shown, right? So what we have over here is we have the concentration of this silver complex, right? So we have Ag, S2O3, right twice 2 minus or 3 minus sorry right we have the concentration of this we have the concentration of bromide divided by the concentration of s2o3 2 minus 
squared right we're not going to include the we're not going to include the solid in the equilibrium constant expression some additional data are given about the dissolution of silver bromide in s2o3 2 minus use your answer to c part 2 and these data to calculate kc for equilibrium 1 include the units for kc now they've given us the solubility product of silver bromide okay so they've given us the ksp of silver bromide which is equal to which is equal to the concentration of ag plus times br minus right and they've given us the k stability for this complex here right and in the k tab for this con for this guy over here what we have is we have ag s2o3 right 3 minus concentration in the numerator right divided by the concentrations of the respective of the respective ligands over here right so what we have is or the, or the respective the respective ions over here so what we have is silver ions and we have s2o3 ions and we have two of these right so this is what this is what the k stability expression looks like this is what the k stability expression looks like now can I say that if I multiply these two expressions over here, I'm going to get Kc? Can I say that if I multiply these two expressions here, I'm going to get Kc? Everyone agree on that, right? If we look here, if we take this expression and this other expression here, right? If we multiply these two expressions, what do we get? If we multiply these two expressions, then the silver and silver cancel each other out, right? And what are we left with? We're left with this complex over here right in the numerator we're left with bromide in the numerator and we have this s2o3 2 minus squared in the denominator so if we just multiply these two together if we multiply these two together right we get kc so then what is the value of kc what's 5.4 into 10 to the power of negative 13 times 2.9 to 10 to the power of 13 the 10 to the power of negative 13 and 10 to the power of 13 cancel each other out so it was just what's 5.4 times 2.9 over here you multiply these two values over here you're gonna get 15.7 okay and what are the units here you have concentration squared in the numerator and concentration squared in the denominator so there will be no units here the numerical values for the stability constants of two other silver one complexes are given an aqueous solution containing silver plus is added to a solution containing equal concentrations of cyanide ions, ammonia, and S2O3 2 minus. The mixture is left to reach equilibrium. Deduce the relative concentrations of these complex ions present in the resulting mixture. Explain your answer. So the highest concentration will be for the complex that has the highest stability constant, right? Because that complex is most likely to form. That complex is most likely to form. And the lowest stability constant here right means that this complex right for ammonia will be formed in the least concentration this is the least likely to form so if you're comparing we're comparing this complex this complex and this complex right these three the s2o3 complex the cyanide complex and the ammonia complex the cyanide complex will be found in the highest concentration because that's the most likely to form it's the most stable whereas the ammonia complex will be the least likely to form right because it has the smallest stability constant okay so we can say that the highest concentration over here will be for the ag cn twice minus complex right followed by the ag s2 o3 twice three minus complex and the lowest concentration will be for the ammonia complex okay And the reason why is because the reason why is because the k stability right the k stability for the ag cn complex is the highest right is the greatest and for the ammonia complex right that's the ethane diamine complex is the smallest the k stab is the smallest or the lowest 
Alternatively, you can say the greater the case tab, the greater the stability constant, the greater the concentration of that complex formed. So here we have question number four, which says, define the term lattice energy. The lattice energy is the energy released. It is the energy released okay, when one mole of a solid lattice, solid ionic lattice, okay, is formed from its constituent gaseous ions, from its constituent gaseous ions. Okay. Under standard conditions. Use the following data to calculate a value for the enthalpy change of solution of copper 2 chloride. You may find it helpful to construct an energy cycle. So here, if we have to find the enthalpy change of solution, right? This is what we're looking to find. We have solid copper 2 chloride dissolving to find, form its aqueous ions, right? So this is the enthalpy change of solution, right? When one mole of a substance, dissolves when one mole of a substance dissolves right to form its aqueous ions in solution so this is x right this is the delta h solution that we're looking to find and they've given us the enthalpy change of hydration of chloride ions and copper 2 plus ions we know hydration enthalpies right is from gaseous ions it's from gaseous ions to aqueous ions so we have we have gaseous chloride ions and we have gaseous copper 2 plus ions over here Right, so these are gaseous ions, and they've given us the lattice energy, which is from gaseous ions to the to the solid lattice. So the lattice energy over here that they've given us is the lattice energy that they've given us is from gaseous ions to the solid lattice is negative two thousand eight hundred and twenty-four. So this is negative two eight two four, right? And then the hydration enthalpy over here is we have for chloride ions is negative three seventy-eight, and for copper two plus is negative two thousand and ninety-nine. Now we have one mole of copper two plus ions. So that's negative 2099. We have two moles of chloride ions. Hydration enthalpy is for one mole of gaseous ions being dissolved. Since we have two moles, right, dissolving here, we're gonna have plus two times negative 378, okay? So then what can we say over here? We can say, we can take, we can start with the gaseous ions here. We can start with the gaseous ions. We can first form the lattice and then dissolve the lattice, right? Or we can directly start from the gaseous ions and dissolve it and dissolve them to form an aqueous solution, right? So here we can say negative 2824 plus x, right? We can say negative 2824 plus x is equal to, right? This route, this is the indirect route, is equal to negative 2099 plus 2 times negative 378. So what does x come out to over here? X comes out to negative 31 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so that's your answer. That's your enthalpy change of solution for copper 2 chloride. The enthalpy change of hydration of calcium 2 plus is negative 1579. Use the data booklet to suggest why there is a big difference in the enthalpy change of hydration for calcium 2 plus and copper 2 plus. So for copper 2 plus, the hydration enthalpy was negative 2099 both copper 2 plus and calcium 2 plus have the same charge right they're both 2 plus ions they're both 2 plus ions so where do you think the difference is coming from there are two factors that affect lattice enthalpies and hydration enthalpies it's the charge on the ions but the charges are the same here so then it'll be the size of the ions right and what you realize is that if you look at the data booklet obviously you won't be getting a data booklet this time but if you do look at the data, what you'll find is that copper 2 plus ions are smaller than calcium 2 plus ions, right? That means that they have a smaller radius, hence the hydration enthalpy is more exothermic, right? Remember, hydration enthalpy is more exothermic if you have a greater charge or if you have a smaller radius, okay? Same for lattice enthalpy. So here we know that if we look at the ionic radius, okay? The ionic radius over here, right? So copper 2 plus is lesser than calcium. So therefore, we can say that the charge density 
charge density of Cu2 plus is greater, okay, is greater than Ca2 plus. Hence, stronger attraction is formed, stronger attraction formed between Cu2 plus and water, right, when Cu2 plus is dissolved in water. Identify the substances formed at the anode and at the cathode during the electrolysis of saturated calcium chloride aqueous. Now, if you have an aqueous solution, right, at the cathode, at the cathode, right, you're either going to reduce calcium 2 plus or you're going to reduce H plus. Now, I don't even need to know, look at the data booklet here. Which of these do you think, which of these do you think will more easily be reduced? We know calcium is a very reactive metal. So, it, it wants to stay in the cation form a lot. So if you compare calcium versus hydrogen, which will form more easily at the cathode, right? Hydrogen gas will easily form at the cathode. You don't even need to look at the data booklet here. We know that calcium is a very reactive metal. So it remains in the cationic form. It's very difficult to form calcium from calcium 2 plus, right? So we know that at the cathode, we're going to have hydrogen gas discharged, right? H plus will be reduced to form hydrogen gas, okay? Now at the anode, at the anode, we're comparing, we're either going to have chlorine gas or we're going to have oxygen gas. Now if you have a saturated chloride solution, if you have a saturated chloride solution, right, then you will get chlorine gas, okay. Even though the discharge of oxygen is favored, the discharge of oxygen is favored in dilute solutions, okay, the, the, electrode potential for this is slightly less negative it's more favored slightly more than chlorine okay but because you have a saturated solution you have a much higher concentration of chloride okay chlorine gas will be discharged so at the anode you're going to have chlorine gas okay so whenever you're talking about chlorine versus oxygen in an aqueous solution if it's saturated or very concentrated chloride then you're going to get chlorine if it's dilute then you're going to get oxygen okay Calcium can be produced by the electrolysis of molten calcium chloride. Calculate the mass in grams of calcium formed when a current of 0.75 amperes passes through calcium chloride for 60 minutes. Here we have molten calcium chloride. Now, for the formation of calcium, right, at the cathode, we have the following half equation, right? We know that calcium 2 plus will gain electrons to form calcium at the cathode. And over here, we can find the number of moles of electrons from the information they've given us and therefore find the number of moles of calcium. So the first thing that we do here is we calculate the charge, right? That is Q is equal to IT. And what is the charge over here? We have a current of 0 0.75 amperes and the time is 60 minutes. So that is 60 times 60 seconds, right? 3600 seconds. So what is the charge here? The charge over here is 2700 coulombs, right? Now we know that one mole of electrons, one mole of electrons has a charge of 96,500 coulombs. So if I have 2,700 coulombs, how many moles of electrons do I have, right? We can simply use the formula Q is equal to NF, right? F over here is Faraday's constant, 96,500, right? N is what we have to calculate, the number of moles of electrons, and Q is 2,700. So 2,700 divided by 96,500 will give us the answer. So here, if we cross multiply, we find that the number of moles of electrons is equal to 0 0.0280 moles, right? So we have 0 0.0280 moles of electrons, right? So then how many moles of calcium are we forming? It's a 1 is to 2 ratio. So 1 is to 2 ratio. So can I say I'm forming half as many moles of calcium, right? 0 0.0140 moles, right? That is 0 0.028 divided by 2, right? So now I have my number of moles of calcium. So then what's the mass of calcium, right? The mass is equal to the number of moles times the molar mass. The number of moles for calcium, right, is equal to 0 0.014 and the molar mass is 40.1. So over here we get 0 0.560 grams of calcium. Okay, so that's your answer. All right. Explain what is meant by the term entropy of a system. Okay. 
So we are, we're no longer going to define entropy as the measure of disorder in a system. Okay, Entropy more precisely can be defined as the number of possible arrangements, number of possible arrangements of particles okay, and their energies and their energy in a given system. Okay, and their energy in a given system. Okay, this is going to be the definition that we're going to use for entropy. Okay, I'm not going to say measure of disorder of a system, right? This is actually a more accurate definition. We're closer to the true definition of entropy. Place one tick in each row of the table and show the sign of each entropy change. NaCl dissolving in water. So when a solid lattice dissolves in water to form aqueous ions, does the entropy increase or decrease? The entropy would increase, right? Because aqueous ions have greater entropy than solid lattices, right? What about water solidifying to ice? You're going from liquid to solid. In this particular case, the entropy would decrease. So delta S would be negative. The evaporation of one mole of water has a standard Gibbs free energy change of positive 8.6 kilojoules at 25 degrees Celsius. Sketch a graph on the axes to show how the Gibbs free energy change changes for this process between 25 degrees Celsius and 150 degrees Celsius and 101 kilopascals. So at what temperature does the evaporation or the boiling of water become completely spontaneous? At what temperature would delta G be equal to zero? It would be zero at a 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, it would be zero at a 100 degrees Celsius, right? At 25 degrees Celsius, the, end, the Gibbs free energy change is positive, right? A little bit of evaporation is happening, but we say that we're, we're saying over here that the process is infeasible, right? At 100 degrees Celsius, the process becomes feasible, right? That's when boiling starts to take place. And then greater than 100 degrees Celsius, the delta G is negative. Okay, so this is the, you can just draw a straight line over here. Okay. The reaction between A and B is feasible at low temperatures, but is not feasible at high temperatures. Deduce the sign of delta H and delta S for this reaction and explain why the feasibility changes with temperature. So what we have is feasibility, right? The reaction is feasible if delta G is negative and the reaction is infeasible if delta G is positive. Now what they're saying here is that if you increase the temperature, if you increase the temperature, the delta G becomes more positive, right? The reaction is not feasible at high temperatures. Now, if I increase the temperature, I'm affecting this term, this minus T delta S term. And what this is saying is that if I increase the temperature, minus T delta S becomes more positive. It becomes more positive. So that means minus T delta S has to be a positive term. So then what does that tell you about T delta S? T delta S must be, T delta S over here must be negative, right? If minus T delta S is positive, T delta S is negative. And you know the temperature is always positive, right? It's absolute temperature. So then what, what does that tell you about delta S? Delta S must be, delta S must be negative, right? Now, what about delta H? The question is saying that the reaction is feasible at low temperatures. Now, if, if the enthalpy change was positive, if the enthalpy change was positive, right? and minus T delta S was also positive. If the enthalpy change was positive and minus T delta S was also positive, then the reaction would never be feasible. It would never be feasible because delta G would always be positive, right? This would be positive and this would be positive. So that means delta H has to be negative here, okay? Delta H has to be negative over here, okay? So we can say that delta H is negative over here. Now explain why the feasibility changes with temperature. So we can say over here that as temperature increases, as temperature increases, right? We can say that delta G becomes less negative or more positive, right? We can say it becomes less negative or we can say that it becomes more positive, right? And the reason why is because we know that because delta S is negative, right? We know that delta S is negative, right? Therefore, minus T delta S is positive and becomes more positive, okay, 
and becomes more positive as temperature increases. As temperature increases. Okay, so that's the reason why. So here we have question number five, which says describe and explain the relative basicities of phenylamine, ethylamine, and 4 nitrophenylamine. Now, first of all, which of these is the most basic? That one is easier to identify. Now, ethylamine has to be the most basic, right? Because it has an electron donating group. It has an electron donating group, right, on the amine, right? We have CH3, CH2, NH2, right? And because we have this electron donation from the ethyl group, the nitrogen lone pair, right? It has greater electron density, so it becomes a stronger base. Okay. Now, what about phenylamine versus 4-nitrophenylamine? Phenylamine is just this NH2, right? Whereas 4-nitrophenylamine has an NH2 and it has an NO2, right? Now, over here, we know that, the, we know that what we have is we have delocalization of electrons in the benzene ring. Right, we have delocalization of electrons in the benzene ring, which makes phenylamine less basic than it makes phenylamine less basic than ammonia, for example. Ethylamine is more basic because of the electron donating group. Phenylamine is less basic because the charge density on the nitrogen on the lone pair is decreasing, right? The electron density is decreasing on the nitrogen. So what about four nitrophenylamine? The NO2 is it an electron withdrawing group or an electron donating group? If you guys remember, NO2 is an electron withdrawing group, right? It's a deactivating group. It's a deactivating group. So then, what does it do to this, to the strength of the nitrogen atom as a base, to the NH2 as a base? If it's if it's electron withdrawing, right? It means that there's even greater electron density going towards the nitro group, making this NH2 even less basic. Okay. So here actually, phenylamine is in the middle. Okay. And 4-nitrophenylamine is actually the least basic, okay? 4-nitrophenylamine is the least basic. Okay, and the most basic over here is, the most basic over here is ethylamine, okay? The most basic over here is ethylamine. And the reason why is because when we talk about ethylamine, okay? Ethylamine. Okay, the presence of the, the, the ethyl group, the ethyl group has a positive inductive effect, right, or is electron donating, has a positive inductive effect. Okay, hence, hence, it increases, it increases the electron density, okay, it increases the electron density on the density on the nitrogen atom, right, or in making it more likely, making it more likely to donate its lone pair, to donate its lone pair, to donate its lone pair and accept protons, right. So that means that ethylamine is the strongest base. Now we can talk about 4-nitrophenylamine, okay, 4-nitrophenylamine is the least basic, right? Is the least basic because because there is there is delocalization delocalization of the lone pairs of the lone pair on the nitrogen atom lone pair on the nitrogen atom into the benzene ring and we also have NO2 as an electron withdrawing group so there's greater delocalization okay there's greater delocalization than even phenylamine okay so therefore it's a weaker base, okay? The dye R can be synthesized from 4-nitrophenylamine in two steps. So in the first step, 
this guy has reacted with something to form Q. And the second step, right, Q is converted to this azo dye over here. Deduce and draw the structure of the organic salt Q in the box. So what is the organic salt, right? If you guys remember phenylamine, phenylamine can be converted into a diazonium salt, right? So what we have is we have an NO2 that stays there. And this guy is converted into a diazonium salt, right? You have this positive charge here. And you can either just show the cation like this, or you can also show the chloride ion like this. So this is a diazonium salt. And the diazonium salt is converted into an azo dye, okay? Suggest reagents and conditions for steps one and two. Now, for step one, what do we use? If we want to convert phenylamine to a diazonium salt, we use NaNO2. We use NaNO2 and HCl, okay? We use NaNO2 and HCl, okay? You may see in the marking scheme that they've said HNO2. HNO2 is formed when NaNO2 and HCl react. HNO2 is actually unstable, okay? So you can't really react HNO2 directly. You use NaNO2 and HCl that forms HNO2 and the HNO2 reacts with the phenylamine to form the diazonium salt, okay? And the temperature has to be less than or equal to 10 degrees Celsius. In some cases, it will be 5 degrees Celsius, okay? So I just, to be cautious, I always write 5 degrees Celsius, okay? And what about step two? How do we convert this diazonium salt into an azo dye, right? What we're gonna use is, well, first of all, we have this structure here. We have this structure over here, right? So this is what we're gonna use. We're using this for sure, right? So in step two, we're using this entire group over here, right? This is what's bonding to the diazonium salt, right? So then what we have is we have this guy okay with the OH group and we're also going to use and we're also going to use alkaline conditions okay we're also going to use alkaline conditions this reaction here okay between a diazonium salt and phenols okay is known as a coupling reaction to form an azo dye so this is what we have this is the main functional group that we have in an azo dye okay this is an azo dye over here all right Compound G can be synthesized from methyl benzene in three steps. Okay, so we're starting with methyl benzene and we're making compound G over here. Right? Give the systematic name of compound G. Now, compound G, the main group over here is benzoic acid, right? So we have benzoic acid, right? And then we have a nitro group on carbon number two and a bromo on carbon number four. The bromo comes first alphabetically, so it'll be 4-bromo and then 2-nitro benzoic acid. Deduce the identities of E and F and draw their structures in the boxes. Now, when we have to draw E and F over here, if you see, the CH3 is eventually converted into a carboxyl group. The CH3 is eventually converted into this carboxylic acid here, right? So that's this, this is going to be oxidized eventually. But my question is, do we oxidize this first or do we oxidize this later? If you notice, the CO2H is three directing. If you guys remember, CO2H is three directing. And we don't have any groups on the three over here, right? We don't have any groups on the, on the three position here. So that means first we're gonna add the NO2 and the bromine, and then we're going to oxidize the CH3. So CH3 will be oxidized right at the end, okay? First NO2 and Br would be substituted on the ring and then the CO2H will be formed. If you form the CO2H first, then the nitro and bromine would go on positions three relative to the carbon group, which will not be possible here. The next thing to notice over here is, we know methyl is 2,4 directing. We know methyl is 2,4 directing, right? Now, so we have a methyl group here. We have a CH3. Now, my first question is this. Do I add the nitro group first or the bromine first? Do I add the nitro group first or the bromine? We know that nitro is three directing. We know that nitro is three directing and methyl is two, four directing. So if I add the nitro first, if I add the nitro first, then I can ensure that the bromine will come over here, right? At the four position with respect to CH3 and the three position with respect to nitro. This is three directing, this is two, four directing. So then in the second reaction, what we have is in step two, 
we're gonna convert this into the into this guy over here and then the last step the CH3 will be oxidized to form CO2H okay suggest reagents and conditions for each of the steps one two three in part C so in the first step we're using concentrated sulfuric acid and concentrated nitric acid right in the first step we're using concentrated sulfuric acid and concentrated nitric acid concentrated nitric acid right sulfuric acid over here is the catalyst and we're going to use a temperature of around 50 degrees celsius okay we're going to heat it mildly now for step two what we're doing is for step two we're adding or we're substituting bromine onto the benzene ring right so for that we're going to use for that we're going to use br2 and albr3 as our catalyst right or we can say febr3 over here either one of them is an acceptable catalyst and then the last step what we're doing is we're oxidizing we're oxidizing the the methyl benzene group to the methyl benzene group to the carboxyl group right so we can use acidified KMnO4 and heat here we have question number six there are four possible structural isomers of C8H10 that contain a benzene ring draw the skeletal formula of the four structural isomers in the appropriate boxes the number of peaks observed in the carbon 13 NMR spectrum of each compound is given okay so what we have over here is first of all we have C8H10 okay and they all have a benzene ring they all have a benzene ring like this right this has a benzene ring this has a benzene ring and this has a benzene ring okay so now we already have six carbon atoms so we only need to we only need to substitute Two more carbon atoms onto the ring okay now let's say let's say that my let's say that my benzene ring had an ethyl group like this how many different peaks would i see in the carbon 13 nmr spectrum for this how many different peaks would i see in the carbon 13 nmr spectrum for this i'd have one two three four right these two are identical five and then six so i'd have six different peaks here so if i just had an ethyl group on the benzene ring if I just had an ethyl group on the benzene ring, I'd see six different peaks. So that is the one with the six peaks. Okay, that's isomer four. Now, on the benzene ring, again, I, I want to have two carbon atoms, right? I want to have two more carbon atoms on this ring since I have C8H10. I already have six. What if I had two methyl groups next to each other? What if I had two methyl groups next to each other? Then I have this symmetric molecule, right? Now, how many different peaks will I see? I have one peak. I have two peaks, I have three peaks, and then I have four peaks. So I'm gonna see four peaks over here. Now if I'm seeing four peaks, that would be isomer, that would be isomer two. So in isomer two, the two methyl groups are next to each other, okay? Now in isomer one, we're seeing three peaks. Okay, in isomer one, we're seeing three peaks. So what if I had something like this? What if I had something like this? I had a benzene ring, okay, that was that had a methyl group on the one and four positions, right? Then I can say over here that I have one peak here, right? These two methyl groups are identical. I have one peak here, right? These two are identical. And then I have one peak for these remaining four carbon atoms. These are all identical carbon atoms. And then in the last case, what I have is I have the methyl groups on the one and three positions with respect to each other, okay? In this particular case, they're saying we have five peaks in the carbon 13 NMR. Why do we have five peaks? The two methyl groups are identical again, because there's a symmetry here. So you have two, right? We have one over here, right? The two methyl groups, then you have two, you have three, and you have four, and then you have five peaks. Okay, so these are your five, four different isomers, okay? For C8H10. A three-step synthesis of X from benzene is suggested as shown, okay? In the first step, in the first step, we have this, we have this group in the presence of AlCl3, okay, and we're making W. Now, this is electrophilic substitution, right? We're doing alkylation over here. And what we're going to do is, 
the carbon that's bonded to the chlorine will end up bonding to the benzene ring, right? We have substitution taking place. So what we end up making over here is we end up making CH2, 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 right? That's CH2s were bonded to the chlorine here. And then we have a CO2H, okay? In step two, this acid group is converted into an acyl chloride. This acid group is converted into an acyl chloride, okay? So we're going to use PCL5 for that. And the third step, in the third step, we're using AlCl3 to form this compound X here, okay? So step one is the alkylation of benzene by electrophilic substitution. Use RCl to represent this compound here. Write an equation to, for the formation of an electrophile from RCl and AlCl3. So we know that the catalyst over here is used to generate the electrophile, right? That's your alkyl group, which will be formed like this, right? We have, we formed the R plus cation and the AlCl4 minus, right? If you guys remember, this R plus is then what substitutes onto the benzene ring, right? This is R over here. This is what substitutes onto the benzene ring. Deduce and draw the structures of W and X in the boxes. Now we've already drawn the structure of W, right? Now what is X? What is X over here? Now what's happening over here is, what's happening over here is in the presence of AlCl3, we have acylation taking place. How do we have acylation taking place? If you guys remember, when we have an acyl chloride like this, right? When you have an acyl chloride like this over here, right? And you react this in the presence of AlCl3, when you react this with AlCl3, what you end up forming is, what you end up forming over here is this. What you end up forming is R, C double bond O, right? Plus, and you also form AlCl4 minus, right? And then this guy, right? This carbon bonds to the benzene ring in electrophilic substitution. Now, in AlCl3, do we have an acyl chloride group over here? We have an acyl chloride group over here, right? This C double bond O, this is where you're going to get the positive charge. This is where you're gonna get the positive charge, okay? And this guy will actually substitute onto the benzene ring. This guy will actually substitute onto the benzene ring. So you're actually closing the ring over here. You're actually closing the ring over here, okay? This carbon atom will end up bonding to the benzene ring over here, okay? So then what will happen? What you have is you have a benzene ring, okay? You have a benzene ring. And now what's happened is that this carbon atom, right, this carbon atom with the C double bond O has ended up bonding to this benzene ring, right? Remember, because you're forming a cation here with AlCl3, right? The Cl breaks off and you form a cation over here and you have electrophilic substitution take place. So this carbon bonds here and then you have a one, two, three, four other carbon atoms that are part of this, right? So you have one, two, three, four. So this is the structure of compound X, okay? You have electrophilic substitution taking place within the same molecule, okay? You have the acyl group over here. The acyl chloride is reacting with the benzene ring in the same molecule, okay? Suggest the reagents and conditions for step two. In step two, we convert the acid to acyl chloride. So we're just gonna use PCL5 or we can use SOCl2, okay? Complete the mechanism for the reaction of benzene with the electrophile formed in B part one. Include all relevant charges and curly arrows showing the movement of electron pairs. Draw the structure of the intermediate. So what we have here is we have our electrophile, right? We're gonna form a carbocation intermediate. Remember the pair of electrons is donated from the ring to the electrophile. We form a carbocation intermediate. And then the electrons from the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen go back into the ring right and we make the and we reform the ring over here okay so then we get the final product and obviously h plus is also released in this process so here we have question number seven which says in aqueous solution chlorine dioxide reacts with hydroxide ions as shown a series of experiments is carried out using different concentrations of chlorine dioxide and hydroxide. The table shows the results obtained. Explain the term order of reaction. Right, the order of the reaction is the power to which 
the power to which the concentration of a reactant is raised in the rate equation. Okay, the power to which the concentration of a reactant is raised in the rate equation. Use the data in the table to determine the order of reaction with respect to each reactant, chlorine dioxide and hydroxide ions. Okay, so let's first look at experiments one and two. Okay, we're keeping the chlorine dioxide concentration the same, but for hydroxide, for hydroxide, we're multiplying the concentration by four. Okay, so when we look at experiments one and two, right, what we're doing is the concentration of hydroxide, right, is changing by a factor of four. That's 0 0.120 divided by 0 0.03 is being multiplied by 4. What's happening to the rate? What's happening to the rate over here? You have 2.88 times 10 to the power of negative 3 divided by 7.2 times 10 to the power of negative 4. So the rate is also being multiplied by a factor of 4. The rate is also being multiplied by a factor of 4. So what does that tell you about the order with respect to hydroxide? Right, with respect to hydroxide, right? The order is equal to 1. You multiply the hydroxide concentration by 4, the rate changes by a factor of 4. Okay, it becomes 4 times greater. Now, let's look at experiments 1 and 3. Let's look at experiments 1 and 3. Here, the chlorine dioxide concentration is changing by a factor of 2.5, right? So if you look at experiments 1 and 3, right, we're looking at the ClO2 concentration, right? We're looking at the ClO2 concentration. What we're doing is, right, we're going from 0 0.02 to 0 0.05. So the concentration is being multiplied by a factor of 2.5. And what's happened to the rate over here? The rate is being multiplied by a factor of, you have 4.5 into 10 to the power of negative 3 divided by 7.2 into 10 to the power of negative 4. So the rate is changing by a factor of 6.25. It's changing by a factor of 6.25, right? And 2.5 squared is 6.25. So if I multiply, if I multiply the concentration of ClO2 by 2.5, the rate changes by 2.5 squared. So therefore we can say, therefore we can say that we know that we know that 2.5 squared is equal to 6.25. So we can say that the order with respect to the concentration of ClO2 is equal to 2. Okay, so it's second order with respect to ClO2 and first order with respect to hydroxide. So the rate equation over here is K times the concentration of hydroxide times the concentration of ClO2 squared. Okay. Use your rate equation and the data from experiment 1 to calculate the rate constant. So what we have is, we have rate is equal to this, right? And from the first experiment, we have this data, right? We have this data over here. The concentration of ClO2 is 0 0.02. The concentration of hydroxide is 0 0.03, okay? So we have K times 0 0.03 for hydroxide and 0 0.02 squared for ClO2 and this is equal to the rate okay and the rate is 7.2 times 10 to the power of negative 4 in experiment 1 so this is equal to 7.20 times 10 to the power of negative 4 so then what is the rate constant coming out to over here so here the rate constant comes out to 60 okay and then what are the units we have rate divided by concentration cube okay so here we have concentration per minute for the rate. Okay, we have concentration per minute for the rate and we have concentration cube in the denominator here, right? So then we have, we have concentration to the power of negative two per minute, okay? And we know concentration to the power of negative two is simply mole to the power of negative two, dm to the power of six, and then we have per minute. So then the rate constant here is 60 mole to the power of negative two, dm to the power of six per minute. All right.
The decomposition of benzene diazonium ions using a large excess of water is a first order reaction. The graph shows the results obtained. Draw the structure of the organic product formed in this reaction. Now, if you guys remember, benzene diazonium, benzene diazonium is this guy. When it's decomposed in water, what does it form? What is the decomposition of what is the decomposition of the diazonium salt result in the formation of? We end up forming a we end up forming a phenol. Okay, when this decomposes, that's why we have to keep the temperature below five degrees Celsius or below ten degrees Celsius for diazonium salts. Okay. Use the graph to determine the rate of reaction at hundred seconds. Show your working. So how do we determine the rate of the reaction at 100 seconds? We have to draw the tangent to the curve at 100 seconds, right? We have to draw the tangent to the curve over here, right? So here's the tangent to the curve. Looks like a good enough tangent to me, right? So then what we have is we have to calculate the rate. We have to calculate the slope of this tangent to get the rate. Remember, the tangent, the slope of the tangent is a change in concentration per divided by the change in time, right? That's the slope. The slope over here, the slope of the tangent would be delta y divided by delta x, which would be the change in concentration divided by the change in time. Right? That's why you're taking the tangent because at this at when time is equal to 100 seconds, at this point, if we draw a tangent, we get the slope of the curve or the slope of the tangent at this point, we find the rate because the rate is just the change in concentration divided by the change in time. So what is the slope of this tangent? Well, let's take two points over here, okay? Let's take this point over here, right? This point has coordinates what? This point has coordinates. T is equal to 20 seconds, right? T is equal to 20 seconds here. And the Y coordinate here is 0 0.016. So we have 20 comma 0 0.016. And then let's take another point here. Let's take, let's take, let's take this point over here, right? Where we have a nice, nice intersection. So that's it. Let's take this point over here, right? And what are the coordinates of this point right here? And the coordinates of this point are we have 240 seconds, 240 seconds, and we have 0 0.003, right? So 240 comma 0 0.003, okay? If you guys want, you can clearly show the construction lines like this, right, for the tangent. I don't know if you guys have learned this in physics, right? When you're taking the slope of the tangent, you can show this right angle triangle to show the two points that you've taken, okay? So these are your two points. So then what is the slope of the tangent? Right, we've taken these two points. So I can say that the slope, okay, is the change in concentration divided by the change in time, right? So that would be y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So that's 0 0.003 minus 0 0.016 divided by 240 minus 20. So what does that slope come out to? So here we get the slope as negative 5.90 times 10 to the power of negative 5. And the units are moles per dm cube per second, right? Now this is this is a negative slope because, because what we have over here is, what we have over here is, right, we're measuring the concentration of a reactant. We're measuring the concentration of a reactant, right? But the rate will always be reported as positive, okay? So the rate over here will be 5.90 times 10 to the power of negative 5 moles per dm cube per second, okay? But this will be a rate of decrease. This is a rate of decrease. That's why the negative here. So the rate is always positive. But if you get if the slope is negative, it means that we have a rate of decrease. If the slope was positive, then it will be a rate of increase, okay? But because here we're looking at the concentration of a reactant, okay, we're going to have a negative slope here. Sketch a concentration time graph for a zero order reaction. Use your graph to suggest how successive half-lives for a zero order reaction vary as the concentration of a reactant decreases. Incre indicate this by placing a tick in the appropriate box in the table. So for a zero order reaction, okay, for a zero order reaction, the concentration decreases linearly with time. Okay, the concentration decreases linearly with time. What that means is that no matter what the concentration, the change in concentration per unit time will remain the same. The slope will be constant because the rate won't be affected by the concentration. 
So you could have a very high concentration or a very low concentration. The rate of the reaction will remain the same. So you'll have a constant slope for a concentration time graph. So therefore we have a straight line because straight lines have a constant slope. And if you look at successive half lives here, okay, let's say we have this and then we have a half of this, right? So what we have over here is, here we have our first half life and then we have our second half life. So what's happening to the successive half lives here? Can I say that the first half life is much greater than the second half life, right? So the successive half lives are decreasing. Okay, the successive half lives are decreasing. For first order, they remain the same, and for second order, the successive half lives increase. Here we have question number eight, which says state and explain the relative rate of hydrolysis of acyl chlorides, alkyl chlorides, and aryl chlorides. Now, if you guys remember, for acyl chlorides, we have the fastest rate of hydrolysis, right? They're the most reactive because of the electron withdrawing oxygen atom, right? Because electron density is withdrawn from the CCL bond, it makes the CCL bond very weak, right? So it hydrolyzes very easily. It breaks very easily. So acyl chlorides have the fastest hydrolysis, okay? Least energy is needed to break this bond. It's a faster reaction. On the other hand, if you talk about aryl chloride, so for example, something like chlorobenzene, you have delocalization of electrons. What that means is into the benzene ring. So what that means is you have greater electron density between the carbon and the chlorine atom. You have greater electron density between the carbon and the chlorine atom. So you can think of it as sort of like a partial pi bond, right? The benzene electrons are overlapping with the lone pair on the chlorine. The p orbital electrons here are overlapping with the chlorine. So you have a partial pi bond character. That makes the CCL bond much stronger. So aryl chlorides actually don't undergo hydrolysis at all, okay? So they react the slowest. Okay? And then alkyl chlorides, which are your normal halogenoalkanes are in the middle, okay? And why? Okay, the reason why is that acyl chlorides, okay? Acyl chlorides have a C double bond O, have a C double bond O, which withdraws which withdraws electron density which withdraws electron density okay it's an electron withdrawing group right away from the ccl bond making it weaker okay and then for for aryl chlorides those are your benzene rings right what you have is the lone pair, lone pair on the, in the p orbital of the chlorine atom, right? Lone pair in p orbital of chlorine atom, okay, delocalizes into the benzene ring, delocalizes into the ring. increasing the electron density in the CCL bond, okay, increasing the electron density, making the, making the CCL bond stronger, okay. This is the same reason why the carbon-oxygen bond in phenols is also very strong, okay. It's the re same reason why the carbon-oxygen bond in the, in the, in phenols is very strong, okay. The drug, Remifentanyl is shown. Remifentanyl is completely hydrolyzed under acidic conditions. Three different organic compounds are formed. Draw the structures for these organic compounds in the boxes. Okay. Now, when we're hydrolyzing this, right, we're going to hydrolyze the ester linkage right here. So, you're going to make this alcohol, right? That's methanol. You're going to make the acid group over here. You're also going to hydrolyze this ester linkage right here. And you're also going to hydrolyze this amide linkage right here. Okay, so what are we making here? What are we making over here? What we're making over here is that the first compound that we're making over here is methanol, right? That's very straightforward. You have methanol here and you're also making methanol over here. Right? That's CH3OH. The next thing that you're making over here is, you're, when you're hydrolyzing this amide over here, right? You're making this guy, right? You made methanol and you're making this guy over here, which is, one, two, three, carbon carboxylic acid, that's propanoic acid. Okay. And then 
the last thing that you have is you have this entire you have this entire group over here you have this entire group over here that's left right so what we have here is this right so let's draw the structure here right what we have is we're going to start on the left hand side so here we're making the here we're making the acid group okay here we're making the acid group like this right oh and then we have this we have this we have this n over here then we have this we have this we have this guy we have this guy right we have this and then this right so we made it up to this ring over here then we have this acid group here right we have this acid group right here which is this right and then we have this n over here this n over here so then we have n okay that is bonded to the benzene ring okay and now the question clearly says this is under acidic conditions this is under acidic conditions so this amine when we when we hydrolyze it okay this guy will actually become an nh2 plus okay so you're making the salt of the amine you're making the salt of the amine here and this nitrogen is already bonded to three different things so this will also gain an additional hydrogen right to get the salt over here okay so then this is these are your two these are your two amine groups that are making the salts right the positively charged salts remember the nitrogen can bond to four different things in the salt form right like the ammonium ion Compound Y C5H10O2 reacts with sodium carbonate to evolve bubbles of gas. The proton NMR spectrum of compound Y and D2O is shown. Use this information to suggest a structure for Y. So here we have the table for the proton NMR spectrum, right? Now, first of all, first of all, we know over here that this is in D2O, so we're not seeing one of the peaks here. So what group over here reacts with sodium carbonate, right? Over here, you must have you must have an acid group you must have an acid group over here right and we know that the proton on the acid group the proton on the acid group doesn't show up on the nmr spectrum because we're using d2o right d when we use d2o any nh or oh protons don't show up so that's why we don't see a singlet here for the for the for the acid group okay now the next thing that we have over here is the next thing that we we see over here is that we see we see two doublets we see two doublets over here so what does that tell you? What does that tell you? It tells us that we have a CH. We have a CH over here. The CH is splitting, it's splitting any neighboring protons into doublets, right? So then so now so now what do we have here? First of all, the first thing that we see is that we have this guy that is bonded directly to that is bonded directly to the C double bond O, right? That's shifting in the range 2.3 to 3. Right, that is directly bonded to the that is directly bonded to the C double bond O. So what we have over here is we have a total of we have a total of five carbon atoms, but we only have three different types of protons. We only have three different types of protons. So we have to draw, we have a four carbons left over here. We have four carbons left, but we only have three different types of protons. So first of all, what we have is we have a CH2 that's bonded to the acid group. We have a CH2 that's bonded to the acid group, right? This CH2 must be bonded to a CH. This CH2 must be bonded to a CH. Right? So this CH2, right, this CH2 over here, I'm gonna call this HA, right, is being split into a doublet by the neighboring one proton. And now this guy is also we have we have another type of proton. We just have one type of proton here that's also being split into a doublet, and it's a much taller doublet. So that means what we have is we have we have two CH3 groups. Since we have only one more type of proton left, we have two CH3 groups. So this hydrogen is your multiplet. This hydrogen is your multiplet, okay? I'm gonna call this HB. And then this is your HC over here. That's also being split into a, that's also being split into a doublet, right? So then this is your structure, okay? Use the data booklet. The proton NMR spectrum and your answer to C part one to complete the table. So at 0 0.95, we have an alkane proton, right? At 0 0.95, we have this proton over here. That those are the two CH3s. Those are your two CH. 
those are your two CH3s over here, right? That give us this very tall peak. So this is alkane, right? The splitting pattern is a doublet. So the splitting pattern is a doublet and we have six protons responsible for that peak, okay? Then we have the CH peak, right? We have the CH peak at 1.9 and that would also be an alkane. But it's slightly higher in the range because it's slightly closer to the C double bond O. So th this guy over here, the CH, this CH over here at 1.9 is showing a multiplet. So it's showing a multiplet. Okay. And the last one that we have is the last one that we have is we have a carbon alkyl next to a C double bond O. We have alkyl next to C double bond O, and this is also a doublet. Okay. So here we have one proton for the multiplet and then we have two protons over here. Right? These are the two protons that we have at 2.2 next to the C double bond O.